new material in American Sign Language. Um, I just want to remind you, though, uh, there are still people taking it for various reasons. There's only a very small handful, but you know, try to not discuss it. Cool. Um, so, but we're going to start grading them, uh, grading the midterms in the next day or so, um, and we hope that at some point in the near future we'll give it back to you. Uh, along with solutions. I'll post the solutions um, as soon as uh, everybody's done taking it as well. If you have questions at that point, you can come talk to me, um, and then we'll try to get back to them. Um, before we do get started today, is there any questions, comments, or concerns that does not concern the midterm or solutions thereof? Yes? Will there be a homework? It won't. discussion uh, last Tuesday, so a week ago, uh, on linear multi-step methods. So I want to review this real quick because it was a week ago, um, and this stuff is going to kind of become something we're going to use time and time again. Um, and just to remind you, we are trying to solve ODEs of various sorts, so systems of ODEs in particular. Um, so it, what, when we're talking about linear multi-step methods, we're really talking about methods that use multiple uh, time step information. So not just UN, which is the information we have, um, but define UN plus one, so that's the next time that we want to find the solution at, but also UN minus one, UN minus two, things like that. So if we actually draw this as a picture, say UN, that's kind of the current time that we know, the most recent time that we know. Uh, we want to compute UN plus one, some linear combination of these, these steps um, and linear combination of the uh, function evaluations f uh, to do this. So there's some, some consequences to this. Um, linear multi-step methods, uh, they can be arbitrarily high order, although they get a little crazy looking once you start going higher and higher order. Um, and they can be uh, advantageous with the Taylor series methods, for instance, if you don't have the, the differentiation of the function f. Um, and you can actually reduce the number of times you're evaluating the function f. So this is kind of predicated on the idea that the function f somehow is hard to evaluate. And for many interesting problems in practice, from science, engineering, uh, that is the case. The function f is very expensive to, to evaluate. Yes? So a good example of this would be you have to solve an eigenvalue system with you know, an n by n matrix to get that out the function f. So kind of the, the big disadvantage to linear multi-step methods um, is that they're not self-starting. Um, if, if we start when, but it turns out UN is the initial condition, we start, I don't have these values behind it. So somehow I need to get it started uh, so that I can use the linear multi-step method going backwards. So that's what we call uh, 
bootstrap it. Uh, we use some other methods so that we can get to a point where we can actually use the data behind us. Uh, you also have to record the data behind you. So if this is a gigantic vector, you know, that might not be uh, great either. Um, you need that, but um, that can be an issue. Uh, the other thing too, the rough method method is all the one step methods are very easy to take a different time step. Say you have some function or some solution um, in time, And this is P. And this, the true solution looks something like this. Very, very quick uh, change in the solution value. And then, you know, by and large, maybe it's just doing something very slowly. So this is what we call transient, or it might be a stiff problem. Uh, we'll talk about that maybe today. Um, the problem here is maybe we can do, take very big time steps because not a lot of it is going on, and all of a sudden we get to this, this big gradient, and we're going to take smaller time steps because we don't want to incur too much error. We want to stay close to the true solution. For one step methods, this is easy because you're only taking one step, time step, and then you can change delta t to whatever you'd like. Uh, and that's actually how the more uh, fancy uh, time steppers work. They actually take adaptive time steps to try to predict what the right time step to take is. Uh, for linear multi step methods, because you use delta t to find these previous things, they're a certain distance apart. You can't change delta t. You're kind of stuck with it. So if you all of a sudden find you're getting Sorry about that. Um, yeah, see, now, now the echo is back. Um, the, uh, the transient, I can't handle it. I have to start all over from scratch in order to get that delta t. Um, so that, that's another one of the big drawbacks here. Um, this is the general form of them. Um, these are, well, this is, this is the Adams methods, uh, which is assuming a very specific type. Um, so we have un plus r, which is actually the thing we're trying to calculate. Uh, un plus r minus 1 is then this, this un, the thing we know. And then we have a bunch of uh, function evaluations, f, going all the way back as far as we want. Um, so this is just a particular type of linear multi-step method. Silence that. Um, and there's a few different examples of these. Um, so here's Adams Bashforth at the top. That's weird. Must not have deleted that. Um, you can see that there is a one-step method that's called an adams bashforth method, method um, and that's Floyd Euler. All right? So you know, these things do overlap quite a bit, especially in the simpler ones. Um, but the two-step method here um, is not Floyd Euler, and it's using un plus 1, un, to find un plus 2. So in this picture here, we know we're trying to find un plus 2, and then we have all the way back to un for that particular one. So this is stuff we know, and this is the thing we're trying to calculate. So it's just a little bit of a different indexing that we had before. Um, so you can kind of keep on going with this. There's as many steps as you want. Uh, these numbers do tend to get kind of large, um, but you can do it. It's a, it's a system of equations that you have to solve in order to find each of these methods. Um, Adams Bashforth, an important point about them are that they're all explicit. So you never have to solve some sort of uh, system of equations, um, unlike uh, backward Euler, if you recall. You, we had a dependence of f on un plus 1, something we didn't know. Adams Rashford does not have that problem. But Adams Moulton, on the other hand, does. So here you can see, uh, say, the one-step method even. Um, is going to be dependent on have f u n plus 1, the thing we're trying to calculate, is going to be inside of f, and we have to figure out how to get that out of there. So it could be a system of equations or maybe a linear, a nonlinear system of equations we have to solve in order to, to deal with that, and it gets you know, progressively longer as we go. So Adam's molten methods are the implicit versions of these methods. And the one thing I do want to point out is that if you look between the one-step method for Adam's molten and the similar method for Adams Bashforth, note that we're actually evaluating at one less point. Right? So the one step method here is forward Euler, only evaluates f once. And the one step method here is evaluating the function f twice, which effectively gets us one more order of accuracy for the same number of steps. Okay? So it's an advantage of Adams Moulton, although usually the implicitness of, of Adams Moulton does tend to be problematic. OK. so. Um, for the first kind of coding piece here, 
um, I want you to take some time and try to code up Adam's bash forth uh, two step. Um, and then we'll do it, and then I'll do the Adam's Melton method as well um, down below. Um, and we'll do all that together. Um, so, so take a little bit of time, look through these methods, um, and of course, uh, think about, again, how do you get it started? How do you get these first points? Um, and why you might want to choose a different uh, method uh, uh, over another method. Okay? So I'll give you a couple of minutes for that. Okay, so uh, we have, it's a two-step method, so if we look back up at the, uh, the two steps here we have, um, we need one step further back than we're going to have, so we have to jump start this somehow. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can do this. Um, you know, general rule of thumb is to usually try to use a order of accurate method that's the same as, as the, the method you're trying to use more generally. Um, so. Uh, one of the easy ones to use would be a two-stage Runcacutta method, um, or really anything that can actually serve as that. So here we have the initial condition. And then we need to compute this first step. So the first step in the actual uh, method. Um, and then just to oops, um, do this, so this would be the first stage of the Runga-Kata method. And then we're just storing it back into UAB2-1 because uh, this is only a two-stage. And generally, we could not do that. Um, so we're going to actually use that value and then store it back into the same spot. Uh, 
Uh, there is actually an interesting question here. Um, when you're evaluating f, if f was actually time dependent, um, in the Rungakata stages, you do need to also modify where you're evaluating it at. Our f is not time dependent explicitly, so we don't have to worry about it. But in general, this really should be effectively at whatever time point we're evaluating at. But that's dependent on the stages. Um, and actually can be different from problem to problem, which you should be doing. OK, so we're getting started. Uh, we have uh, Rungakata has given us our first time step. And from now on, we're going to use uh, this business up here. So I'm going to do n plus 2 is equal to uab2. Oh, I really want to type absolute for some odd reason. Um, n plus 1 plus delta t divided by 2. That's minus f uh, t n. Yes, OK. Uh, UAB2 n plus 3 times f evaluated at t n plus 1 UAB2 n plus 1. So. By doing this indexing in particular, I've, I've kind of made sure that whatever my rule up above is, it looks like it, it, it does in the code. Um, you don't have to do this. Uh, there are actually easier ways to index this. But I do find that uh, for myself, that if I actually make sure that it matches, I avoid errors. Because um, now I don't have to translate indices all over the place. So I highly recommend to do it. Um, deal with the indexing of the loop uh, rather than maybe making a mistake typing out this thing, because it's sometimes very difficult to find those types of things. So if I didn't make a mistake, uh, oops, yeah, see there's the absolute value thing again. How many times did I do it? There we go. OK. So we can see it solves the ODE uh, quite nicely. Okay. So similarly, um, if we go down to Adams Moulton and we try to do the same thing, we're going to have a little bit of a problem um, in this case, because we're uh, trying to do something that has dependence on the thing we don't know inside of an F, this right here. Um, so I, before I actually jump into how to do this, uh, this is a good opportunity to, again, try to figure that out. Um, we're going to calculate a constant and use it. Um, what that constant is going to be is going to come up later today. So we're going to see how that happens. But give it a go. Try to actually write down the, the actual formula, given that we know F is going to be uh, uh, negative 1 times u. Um, so keep, keep the lambda in there if you'd like, or negative lambda, because um, that'll make it generic. But try to actually figure out exactly what the update formula looks like, and we'll code that up as well. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to uh, bootstrap our method. Um, and then we'll come together and do some, a little bit of algebra, and then implement the rest of this. So I'll give you a couple minutes for that.
All right. So uh, we're going to plug this in. Um, we're going to follow the same procedure we did before. Uh, we know what f is, so we can plug that in. Um, and then we're just going to solve for un plus 2 on one side and un plus 1 and un on the other side. So we have un and un plus 1 that we are fine with. It's, it's just going to stick on that side. Um, let's expand this out. So we get un plus 2 is equal to un plus 1 plus delta t over 12 times negative lambda uh, un plus 8 lambda un plus 1 plus 5 lambda un plus 2. Okay, so just to remind you, uh, we're solving the ODE. It looks like that. Okay, so just plugging in everything. Um, so we have lots of different common factors here. Uh, it's not so important. We really, what we want to do is get rid of, um, I put an extra and see there. Uh, we just need to get this thing by itself. All right, so we're going to move that to the other side, and then the rest of it we can leave alone, or I'll rewrite it a little bit. Um, so moving 5 lambda un plus 2 times this to this other side means we're going to get un plus 2 times 1 minus 5 twelfths. Uh, delta t lambda. I did that right? I think so. Um, and then on the other side, we're going to have un plus 1. So we'll, we'll gather those terms just for ease of evaluation. So you get 1 plus 8 divided by 12 lambda delta t. And then we still have minus lambda delta t over 12 un. Okay. So now all we need to do is actually divide through by this thing. Um, so in reality, I mean, you know, we really can't simplify this any further like this. And we're just going to use this, this piece here. Um, and we're going to pre-compute that. So the update formula in the end is going to look like this. And there's, you'll see why I'm grouping delta t and lambda together. We're going to actually turn that into another variable later today. So we will continue to do that. Um, and that's going to multiply everything over here. And if we're really being good, maybe we'd uh, pre-compute these things too, but it's not as critical in this case. Okay, so that should give us, use the right parentheses, our integration constant. If I did that right, yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have integration constant. I'm going to define as that division. So this is the, probably the most annoying thing about writing uh, mathematics with Python is that lambda is a keyword in Python. So I can't use lambda. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have also run into this. Uh, all right. I forgive them. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're just going to define that here. So this is this is just this piece here. Um, note that uh, depending on what version of the notes, I actually finally got tired of having the negative sign be somewhat inconsistent, and I just stuck it in the decay constant. So if this looks slightly different than what's uh, in the notes posted, that's why. Um, but now we can actually just write down our two-step method uh, as is. So we have, well, it's behind me now, actually. K or in constant um, times un plus 1 times 1 plus 8 divided by 12. Of course, we could simplify that. Um, and then plus or minus un times uh, delta t times decay constant divided by 12. I think I got that. So if I coded it, yeah, there you go. Okay. Now, no, I'm actually using a lot less time steps here. That's because actually this is a third order method. Um, so technically speaking, it was probably unwise of me to use uh, Rungakata uh, two stage because that's only second order. Um, but by and large, as long as you're taking enough time steps, it 
won't pollute the solution too much. You are making an error that is second order, but it often isn't going to come out uh, when we actually look at accuracy. Um, OK. Any questions about how that kind of comes together? All right. So we have to talk about error. Um, so this is the definition of the truncation error. We talked about this a week ago. Um, and this is just happens to be specifically about linear multi-step methods. Um, so we have uh, 1 over delta t times, in general, the sum alpha j u n plus j. So the alpha j's are always out in front of the evaluations of the u's. Um, and then the beta j's are out in front of the f's. So the alpha j's and the beta j's are the things we get to determine. And that determines what functions we're using or what, uh, what method we're using. OK, so if we want a particular truncation error, we would want everything to kind of cancel out in just such a way that we're going to be left with you know, something delta t to the nth power. Um, and that's the, basically the idea here. Um, so if you start writing this stuff out, uh, we're going to replace a bunch of stuff with Taylor series as usual. Um, for instance, when we're actually writing this out in the truncation error, so down here, um, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate at the true solution. That's the definition of how we compute the truncation error in that case. We have all these Taylor series. So now I'm writing down the, the jth forward-looking Taylor series, because I need all of them. I'm going to center it at UTN. You could technically center it anywhere you wanted. Um, it doesn't going to make that much of a difference. It's just that ends up being the easiest one to do. So I plug those all in, and I collect terms. So I'm just taking the Taylor series for each of these UN, uh, TN plus Js, plugging them in and collecting the like terms to, oops, there we go. Uh, and then I get this kind of telescoping sums. So I have, the first one is the sums of the alpha Js, UN plus J. So that's just from the original term we have. Um, I want that thing to go away because if it didn't, if something was left over in this term here, I'd have a one over delta T which means as delta t gets smaller, this is going to be blowing up. That's not good. So first rule <laughs> is that we want the sum of the alpha j's to be 0. Okay, so we can guarantee that that term disappears. Right? So that's condition number one on any linear multi-step method. The sum of the alpha j's always has to be 0. And all of our Adams Moulton and Adams Bashforth methods satisfy that because we only have two alpha j's that are non-zero, um, and they're equal and opposite. Okay? So that's one term. This next term, it has a sum j alpha j minus beta j. It's multiplied by u prime tn. What do we want that to be? What's the condition on the sum of the j alpha j's minus beta j's? It's down below, but. <laughs> do we want that term to stick around? Remember, this is the truncation error, all right? We don't, we, what we want to see is we want to be able to specify exactly delta t. The order of this thing over here has to be delta t to some power. Does this have a delta t power t next to it? No, it's order 1 and delta t to the 0 power. If we kept this term, this term lay, was laying around, we'd actually have an order 1 error, which is also not good. Um, it wouldn't decay or grow or anything uh, dependent on delta t. So we also require that this sum here is 0. So there's two conditions. Um, on all Adams methods, or actually, excuse me, all linear multi-step methods, um, for the method to be what we call consistent. So it doesn't actually solve what we think it's solving. Right? Past that, now I start seeing orders of delta t. Okay? And it goes up as high as you'd like. If you want to go and say, I want to have a delta t order uh, error, I can stop here. I don't care what this is. I could specify it, but I don't care because it's being multiplied by delta t. Now, if I was going to have multiple conditions like this, I might want to you know, get the highest order possible. So really what this is coming down to is for uh, my unknowns, I always have at least two unknowns. Right? For, for, to make it a one-step method, I have two unknowns. I have two alpha j's and two beta j's. Um, I can specify the alpha j 0, or the one out in front of the thing I'm trying to solve for is 1. That's just kind of a... a, a um, a normalization constant. But then I have to have enough conditions such that I find the rest of the alpha j's and beta j's. Okay, so it makes this consistent. Past that, I can start solving extra of these different sums so, such that I get a system of equations 
for the alpha j's and the beta j's going forward. So that's actually how we find arbitrary linear multi-step methods is continuing to find all of these conditions, solving them simultaneously to find whatever solution we want. Okay? So that's kind of the idea. And then by, by the fact that we've constructed it this way, we actually figure out exactly what the error looks like because it's just going to be whatever term doesn't go to zero um, in my sum. Okay. So for instance, if I wanted to have a two-stage or two-step uh, adams Rashforth method, that determines one of the alpha j's uh, and actually one of the beta j's, and then I'd also want this summation to go to zero. Okay. And that would leave the delta t squared term as the next order for that. So does this work? Well, I would probably not be talking about it if it didn't. Um, so we can do the same type of convergence and comparisons um, as we want. So these are all two-stage or two-step methods. Um, so Rungakutta and adams Bashforth on the blue lines here. Um, adams Bashforth has a little bit of a uh, small error constant, or a little bit bigger error constant than Rungakutta does in this case. Uh, but they're still both converging at the same order. And then adams molten two-step is one order greater. So the reason why adams molten is always going to be one order greater than adams Bashforth, the same number of steps, is that um, adams Bashforth actually specifies and has one less degree of freedom, which means I can, I can only do uh, part, one less of these conditions. I don't have that, that luxury to actually specify that. So that one degree of freedom more gets me another stage, or another order of accuracy um, for that. Okay. So are there any questions about that idea? You can probably assume you'll be asked to find one of these methods at some point just to warn you. So um, it's, this is one of these things where it's, you know, I can, I can sit, stand up here and explain it to you until I'm blue in the face. However, if you just like look at the two-stage one and just see if it makes sense that you can get back out what you think you should be able to get out, that's, that's actually usually more helpful. So just throwing that out there as well. Uh, okay. So the last kind of broad class of methods, and we're only, we're only going over some of the methods. We're actually going to introduce some more uh, today and on Thursday. Um, but I do want to mention predictor corrector methods. So the idea here is that um, we use two different methods, one that's going to predict the solution to the ODE, and one that's going to make that solution better. So that's predict the solution and then correct that solution that way. Um, oftentimes, uh, the way we use these is for things that are implicit methods. So adams molten methods, we had to do all this stuff to get it to be uh, solvable. Oftentimes, we don't know what f is, or f is something complicated or nonlinear, and we can't solve it. That's usually the case for more uh, interesting problems. So instead, well, OK, so we could probably write a, 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 you know, a root finding uh, method or something like that. But the other way we could do it is we can use a predictor that's explicit, and then the corrector is going to be implicit. We use the guess from the predictor at what the thing I don't know is. I plug it in, and I get, end up having all the information that I need. So what's this look like? We're going to just do it with adams Bashforth and adams Moulton. Um, for one step, it says that's easiest. So it looks like this. This is the predictor. So this is just forward Euler in this case. Uh, I, I know everything on the right-hand side here, and I get out a guess. So the u hat n plus 1 is my predicted value. And then this would normally be an implicit method, an implicit method. But for the, the value that I didn't know before, and I had to do some algebra or you know, somehow get an f, instead I'm going to use my predicted value. So I no longer have that problem. I can just plug this in and compute, and everything is a step-by-step -step process. Um, and this actually leads to a second-order accurate method. Even though the first predictor was only first order, the second one, uh, second step is second order. We know that this is this to be the case. We actually end up finding that it is second order overall. Um, now, doing error analysis on predictor corrector methods is not easy, um, because all of a sudden you're starting to uh, plug things into other things. So it's like Runge-Kutta methods in which we have kind of have to do Taylor series that are uh, expansions of f, valuations of f, but you can do it. Um, this looks mostly like uh, something from a multi-stage Runge-Kutta method. Okay. 
So let's code this up real quick. Um, so we're going to have u0, the initialize, and then we're going to have our loop. Uh, so this is going to be our predictor. And again, I could just store it in EU half or something like that. That's fine. In this case, because we only have to store one value, we're just going to store it in the thing that we're going to update next. So here's the predicted value. And then we, we uh, correct that predicted value using our higher order method. I'll divide by two. I could type. So again, we've already defined what un plus one is. We're just using that predicted value. Um, and this is the method. Uh, and we see that it works. Okay. So actually, most of the time when you're seeing a very complicated uh, ODE solver, they're going to be using things like this, some sort of cheap predictor, maybe to see what the solution is doing so it can maybe figure out if the solution is changing quickly, maybe change the delta t um, and adapt to what's going on. Uh, so there's all sorts of ways to actually kind of combine all these methods into something that's much more powerful than one particular method is. Okay. Is there any questions? Otherwise, we go to part two. All right. So let me switch over here. There is no template for this. There's a lot less coding in this section. Yeah. Depends on the problem, but we're going to cover that now. That's a good lead-in. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it is, it's in general, it's specified by the problem, and it also has to do uh, with what we're trying to do. Um, so it is actually a complicated answer to that. Uh, a lot of people will just t pick a delta t, and then as long as it works, they, they're fine with it, <laughs> which is not a great thing. So uh, we, we like to be a little bit uh, smarter about that if we can. OK. So part one was a lot of just like methods. We constructed some methods. We did a little bit of uh, error analysis. We saw convergence orders and things like that. This part is going to be talking about more of that theory of error and convergence, and kind of our uh, a more specific definition of convergence in this case. Um, so quite a bit more theory. So bear with me. All right. So I've been banding about this word convergence uh, for a while. Um, we have an idea of what that means. You know, it's, it's basically talking about the rate at which um, a solution is converging to the true solution. Right, you change delta t, making it smaller. It's hopefully going to make the solution better. Um, we're going to kind of talk more broadly about convergence now. Um, convergence is the general idea that does it converge to the true solution. Um, this has been somewhat of a trivial uh, question before, but now it's more complicated. Um, so that's going to be actually the general topic. Um, so in the background, just keep in mind that we have some, some sequence of uh, approximate solutions. They're indexed by capital N or delta T. And if it's capital N, as N goes to infinity, we want to converge to a true solution at a particular time in the future. So TF would be T final or whatever you want. So that's our notion of something converging to the true solution. Um, what rate that true solution is, is basically the order of convergence. All right. Um, so there's some definitions. Of course, you can go between uh, little n, capital N, delta t. This is, you know, if you're just assuming that delta t, you want, you want to be uniform, then we could just divide. Sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than that. But, um, you know, we can kind of go interchangeably between these things, and we will a little bit. Um, so we have delta t going to 0. That's also the exact same type of statement. Um, but the two key things here, um, we have to have two properties for a ODE method to converge. Um, one is that it's consistent. So consistency means that as the truncation error uh, will go to some order power. So if delta t p, if p is greater than 0, we say the, the method is consistent. 
as delta t goes to zero, that error disappears. We need that. So this one we have a lot of experience with, um, and we need this. So consistency in this case is it's consistent with the true solution or consistent with the true equation. We're really using a numerical approximation that's consistent with the continuous version of that equation. This other statement, um, we need something to be zero stable. Sometimes this is just uh, truncated uh, uh, to be stable. I want a method that's stable. What does that mean? Well, right now we've been talking about truncation error, which is fine. But this is kind of the error in some sense of what we're making at every step along the way. If we have to go to some final time, not just delta t in the future, but some final time that's multiple delta t, um, then this starts to, uh, to become an issue. Okay? So this is saying if my delta t errors are, are, uh, I'm making, can they build up as I keep on going so that this actually starts to dominate? So even if I'm making small errors, I'm actually still not OK. The thing is going to blow up. Right? So this is the more important thing, and it's, this is much harder to, to get at. Uh, this is usually easy to do. This is usually much more difficult. Um, so that's where actually why we're going to be talking about stability for the, <laughs> for the rest of this lecture. Okay. Um, zero stable, what that actually refers to is this exact statement. Um, as delta t goes to zero, can you show that the errors that you're making at each step along the process uh, also go to zero? So somehow they're bounded. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind with all this discussion, um, if we really were interested in letting delta t go to zero, that means that I'm going to take an infinite number of time steps. So even if these are growing, so I'm making some delta t error, but even if these are growing, or the errors I'm making in the past are growing in time, I'm going to have an infinite number of times to, to get to that point where it's blowing up. So that's not good. So we want to show basically that both of these things, these things are going to be bounded somehow. All right, so I said a lot of definitions, but let's actually do an example. Um, uh, and forward Euler is the, the easiest method we can do an example on, okay? and on a linear problem, no less. So we have our usual du dt is equal to lambda u. Okay? We have some initial condition. Uh, we know the solution to this. Um, and we can you know, go to town on this all we want. Um, but So let's just apply forward Euler to this problem. So we have some un value, um, and then we're going to un plus 1. Um, so that's, that's this. And I'm just rewriting it so that I have 1 plus delta t times lambda times un. Okay? So note that the way that I'm writing this, the, the difference between un plus 1 and un is this factor 1 plus delta t times lambda. So that is going to, to control it. If lambda is less than 0, in this case, um, that means that uh, un to un plus 1, un plus 1 is going to be smaller than un, one would hope, because um, delta t can't be negative. Um, if lambda is greater than, than 0, uh, that means that things are growing, and we see that un plus 1 is greater than un. So that's more just a consistency check. Right? We're actually, the thing is going to be growing at some rate, and it's actually working the way we think it is. Uh, in this case. All right, so let's go to the truncation error. Um, so here's one of the definitions of truncation error we've had before. Um, we have 1 over delta t, um, and the difference between the calculated un plus 1 and the true un plus 1. All right, so we plug that in. We've computed un plus 1, un plus 1, little un plus 1 just sits there. Um, so I have this. This is fine, you know, nothing too strenuous here. We kind of did this before. Usually, we'd just take a, uh, a Taylor series of this thing, and then we get back out um, some order delta t back out. But instead of doing that, we're going to take this, and I'm going to rearrange it so that u and utn plus 1 is going to be equal to 1 plus delta t lambda utn. So recall that this is that thing up there, minus delta t times tn. And I don't know why that's a superscript all of a sudden. That's not t to the n power. It's the nth truncation error. Um, Technically speaking, this could change in time, uh, but usually, for our purposes, it won't. Okay? So we have this. We have some relationship between u uh, t at tn, u at tn plus 1, plus something about the truncation error. Okay? All right. So we're going to define a new thing called the global error. Um, the global error is really saying, I'm at, 
I start at t0, some initial time, and I go to time tn. So maybe that's t final, maybe it's not. Um, so the global error at tn is going to be the difference between the true and the computed solution. It's not so surprising. Uh, but the idea here is that we're taking multiple time steps to get there now. Okay, that's, that's kind of the key here. So we're, we're trying to see how the error is growing um, as we go forward. This becomes, basically, you can kind of extract everything out. So you say un plus 1 minus un plus 1. So this would be the global error at tn plus 1. It has the un plus 1 business, because we just derived that from the last slide. Okay, so that's what this value is. And I put the n in the right spot. Uh, and then I have capital UN plus 1, because I know what that is as well. That's the approximation I'm making. Okay? Well, I can keep on going. <laughs> right? I can keep on actually expanding these out until I'm, I'm going further and further back in time. Or I can rewrite this such that um, just rewriting things, um, I can find out that EN plus 1, so again, this part here, is equal to 1 plus delta T lambda times EN. Okay? And that's just rewriting this because we have uh, UN and the capital UN here. So you just combine terms, you find EN. Okay. Minus delta T, TN. Okay, so what is this saying? Well, the global error that I've committed up to TN is being changed by this. So 1 plus delta T lambda. And then there's some truncation error being added to it. Okay? And that's giving me my new global error. So we want our global error to go to 0 as delta T goes to 0. That would prove convergence, um, just by our definitions. So now we see, OK, so it's all the stuff I've done before. It's the stuff I'm, I'm making a mistake about now. And that is, gives me my new global error. So again, nothing you know, too complex, but these, these constants out in front are going to be important. Right? So we have 1 plus delta t lambda and a delta t. So as delta t goes to 0, or maybe we're not so concerned about this, but what is tn? Well, we're going to have to put requirements on that. The global error, hopefully, is also not growing. It is dependent on delta t, because we know it, uh, what it is going forward. Right? So now we're going to expand all this. All right. So as we go back in time, uh, we start with, we're going to restart at en. Uh, we expand that out to en minus 1, tn minus 1, using our formula from before. And we expand those out. So en minus 1 was this. We still have tn minus 1. We do it again. So we have the en minus 2 definition. Um, you see that now we're actually seeing that this is actually going to start multiplying itself. It's going to be multiplicative, um, which could be problematic. Uh, and then we can go back to t0 if we'd like, which is exactly what we want to do. Um, we can rewrite this process basically starting at e0. So the global error at e0 is really just saying, do you have an error when you were approximating the initial condition? It could be. It could be a function you're trying to evaluate and you didn't do it very well. Um, by and large, we're just going to say that's 0 or close enough to 0 that we don't care about it too much. Um, but the rest of this stuff is important. We have this sum. It's composed of all the truncation errors that I've made. They're multiplied by a growing number of these 1 plus delta t lambdas. Um, and then there's another delta t out in front of that. Okay, so we need to prove that this thing goes to 0 as delta t goes to 0. That's our goal. All right, so let's do it. Um, we're going to bound a bunch of terms using an exponential. As we kind of know what this thing looks like. In fact, this is related to the true solution we had. Um, we can say that, well, the, this thing is going to always be greater than or equal to 1 plus delta t lambda. The reason why we can say that is that this is, of course, the beginning of the Taylor series approximation of E, the exponential. So this is always going to be greater than this thing on the right-hand side. Okay? That's just where that's coming from. Um, and of course, we're going to see 1 plus delta t lambdas all over the place. Um, so it'll be a little easier to deal with them if we use that exponential. Um, we can also, we see this complicated you know, n minus i term. Um, so we're getting more of these multiplications coming in. Well, we can use the same bounding principle. 1 plus delta t, the n minus i, is less than or equal to e to the n minus i delta t times lambda. Um, and so I can eventually just actually bound this by e to the lambda tf. The tf is coming from the fact that I have n, which is the number of time steps I'm taking, times delta t. And we define that as the final time. So this is n is controlling how many time steps we're taking overall. Right? That thing, e lambda tf, is a constant. 
So I mean, I guess it could blow up, but hopefully uh, it doesn't. We don't want to go to time infinity. That's a different problem. Uh, and if lambda is infinity, then something else has gone wrong So <laughs> in our, our problem statement. Um, so we like that. That's a bounded thing. All right, so let's turn back to expression. Um, we have, we're going to take absolute values, do some triangle inequality, um, and get from our general statement here to a statement um, about bounding this thing. Okay, so that's just triangle inequality uh, applied to a couple different things. Uh, there's some obvious assumptions that have to go into that. Um, for this stuff, it generally doesn't matter. Um, we, we find that we have the right uh, assumptions. Um, so there's some things in here. So I've already actually replaced my 1 plus delta t lambda to the n minus i. When I put an uh, absolute value sign around it, I'm just replacing that with the, the function that I found before that bounds it. The same thing here. So I get e lambda delta t and e lambda tf in those. That has a common factor of e lambda tf, if I'm careful about it. Um, really what it means is that I'm actually just going to bound it by e lambda tf. So this thing is smaller than this. All right, that's because there's more delta t's than that. Um, so I kind of go on my merry way. I have e plus delta t times the summation of just the truncation errors now, um, all the way up to the last step. Well, so these could be changing. That's fine. But I can say, well, I'm just going to take the maximum truncation error I'm ever going to make, and I'm going to multiply that by n, because I'm going to do it n times. So this term here is going to be uh, bounded by the maximum error I'm making times I'm making n of them. Okay. All right, problems there. We have this thing. We do know what the truncation error is. Um, it's this thing here. So we're going to plug that in. Um, we still have the TF out, out in front. Um, oh, n times delta t we also replaced. So this is, again, TF. Um, that's fine. Another bounded value. Um, plug in the truncation error up to whatever delta t squared we want. Um, and I can actually come down here now and say, well, if E0 is 0 or something very small or maybe dependent on delta t, which would be weird. But somehow we have to make sure that that thing isn't weird. <laughs> so it's good to just say it's 0. We're approximating the initial condition exactly. Um, and then I get this statement. So I have some stuff out in front, which is bounded. I have my truncation error. And that means that this entire expression is going to be approximately or asymptotically equal to delta t of order of delta t, which means the global error is also bounded by something that's delta t, uh, which means that this thing converges. So we have proven through this zero stability for a very particular OEE, the easiest one possible, perhaps, uh, and for the easiest method we have. Zero stability is really hard to prove. <laughs> this is the easiest possible. We could have made it for ourselves. In general, it's not provable. And it really has to do with the fact that we need to take limits as delta t goes to zero. And that's just a really difficult thing to be able to do. So we need to figure out a different way. This isn't practical. Uh, this is practical if you want to be a mathematician and uh, get paid a lot for doing proofs like this. But uh, some of us like to do problems that have some sort of implications. So we're going to do that. We're going to find a better way to actually do this. Okay? The, the most general way that an 